Welcome, everybody, to the Healing Place Podcast. I am your host, Terry Welbrock. Excited to have with me here today, Ingrid Cochran, and I'm going to have to read this because it's a good title. Tennessee Midwest Community Facilitator with ACES Connection, and then also Sue Fort White, and she is the Executive Director for Our Kids uh, in Nashville, Tennessee. So welcome. I'm excited to have you both. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, so talk to me about um, Our Kids and, and what that space is all about. Our Kids is all about help, hope, and healing. We are, um, we are a, a medical clinic. We provide medical evaluations and crisis counseling in response to child sexual abuse. So we are trauma-informed. We always have, always for the last 32 years, have integrated both the medical evaluation services and also the mental health services. Um, we are one of the largest clinics of our kind in the country with a patient volume of over 850 children a year. Goodness. And I think that what we, we serve 47 counties in Middle Tennessee. And what another thing that makes us so, I think, so special and distinguishes us um, is that it, the nurse practitioners and social workers, so it's multidisciplinary, uh, they share a call 24 7 every day um, and every night of the year. And so we are always available um, to respond to emergencies. And the other thing that's really, really different about the issue of child sexual abuse. This is not a 20 minute medical transaction. This is more of a very intense encounter that lasts usually between an hour and a half and four hours, depending on the, the nature of the sexual contact, the last contact and all that. And the reason why it's so intense is because 95% of the time, Terry, the per perpetrator is someone that's known and trusted and even loved by the child and family. So the distress, of the non-offending caregiver is is really is really intense. Yes, I can't even. You know, I I went through my share, fair share of uh, sexual abuse by various predators, and I can't even imagine. Um, you know, had my parents known. You know, when I was younger, I didn't tell till I was thirty-two years old. So. Yes, um, the impact, my goodness, on the child, but then, um, you know, the loved ones in that child's life. Yes. Yeah. So. And also the fact that, you know, that you didn't tell anyone until you were 32 years old. And that is really not unusual. Sometimes we sit around and think, it is amazing that we have this level of patient volume just because of the, of the confusion, the fear, the shame, the guilt that the child feels, you know, um, mostly because of the grooming and because of the transactions that have happened. Uh, and, and they really, I think, often do feel like, you know, I'm going to be in trouble. Yeah. Or, 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 or I think they sense, many times they sense, if I tell, everything will change. Right. And that's hard. It's hard for the child. Absolutely. I know with two of mine, uh, there was a death threat made to my, towards my mother. You know, if you tell anyone, I'll kill your mother. Um, exactly. Yeah. And so, but yeah. And there was a certain amount of guilt and like a shame, almost as if I was guilty for um, what had happened. So, yeah. Exactly. And, and later on in our conversation, I want to come back to that because I, I want to talk about the, the campaign, What If I Told You, but I certainly also want you to get to talk to, to Ingrid, Ingrid as well. But um, it's, it's a very, very complex um, and, and a very disturbing topic. Oh, without a doubt. Yes. Uh, well, I can't agree more. And I'm Catholic. And so now with everything happening with the Catholic Church, you know, it's just exploding onto the scene and it breaks my heart and angers me. Um, but I, it's, it's time it's talked about. It's time it's talked about. So um, I'm glad you brought that up because um, uh, the Tennessean published an op-ed that I, I wrote um, uh, in unison with one of our wonderful board members here at Our Kids. And I started with saying there are many, many soul crushing things that are happening in the world, but the, all the issues with the church around um, the child sexual abuse and the cover-ups and, and all of that. It's, it's, um, 
It is so important that we are talking about this, that we are sharing information, because information is power, and we're sharing resources, because resources are medicine. Yes, absolutely. And what a beautiful, what a beautiful way to look at that and put that. Yes, resources are medicine. Yeah, brilliant. Um, I know, again, you know, I keep coming back to myself, but only because it, it correlates in that, you know, one of mine was my choir director, and it was, you know, through the church, and it was repeated. It was, it was you know, not just a one-time incident, but um, repeated, and yeah, and again, later found out, you know, there was a big cover-up with that as well, that it wasn't just me, but multiple, multiple girls that this was happening to over years. Um, so yeah, I think I applaud all efforts and all, you know, anything that's being done to help these kiddos and to help shine the light on this. So thank you. Thank you both for, for what you're doing. Yes. Yeah. So how, um, how did you get into what it is you're doing? Um, well, I, uh, the very first time someone ever disclosed their sexual abuse to me, was when I was 18 years old and I was astounded. Um, and the level of detail and the level of shame and the level of guilt and, and distress on, with my friend, um, I, I thought, wow, like, you know, what is this? And, and it was just the beginning for me of really a sacred journey of, um, you know, as I look back in the rearview mirror of my of my career, it's um, it's all tied together. Like I, you know, I feel very uh, I feel very privileged that I have been a safe person for many people to share their um, their abuse history, um, and some really oftentimes I'm the first person that they share it with. And over the years, I mean, I, I've um, been in a lot of um, Nonprofit sectors. I have always been really interested in mobilizing resources for disenfranchised populations, and certainly children in foster care, women in prison, um, uh, homeless youth, and 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 sexually abused children. So, um, yeah. So I um, I have a real heart for the adult survivors because I really feel like uh, that yes, prevention is so important. But part of what Ingrid and I are very, very, uh, very, very uh, involved with is the whole adverse childhood experience yeah. uh, space. And we feel that it is absolutely crucial to not just prevent adverse childhood experience, but really mitigate what has happened, you know, to adults so that they can move forward with more hope, with more tools, with a new way of looking at their journey. And yes, I'm that, gonna, that whole gonna... resilience thing, which is just fabulous. And that's why I love ACEs so much. And I love that community. I am so, I just feel blessed to be a part of it, to have found it. And again, um, yes. thank you for the work. So Ingrid, yes, what, what's your role within this organization? And then, yes, if you want to talk about, you know, ACEs. So I'm with ACEs Connection. My role is a community facilitator. I help different um places, geography, you know, when I think about geo spaces, to get ACEs initiatives started. And so what I do is I reach out to different states and say, what are you doing? Please join us and basically have a place on our site where you can share information and resources. And a part of that is, is blogging, which is how um, I came in contact with you is the, the blog I did about our kids and the What If I Told You campaign. Yes. Yeah, I think that's exactly, I think I had seen something that you had written. Um, yes, and, and was very interested in, in the work that was being done there and right, and what you're doing. So, wonderful. All and right, so. We know each other through ACE Nashville, yeah. which is the collective impact here in Nashville, Tennessee yes. that's addressing ACEs. Okay. I just, I had never been to Nashville, not to change the subject, but to change the subject a little, just a little bit. And we were coming back from Florida from a vacation and we said, and traffic was crazy and we're trying to get back to Cincinnati. And we said, oh, let's just stop in Nashville. So we stopped and stayed and had a blast. <laughs> yes, we welcome that. We love yeah. that. 
It was beautiful. So yes, beautiful city. Very cool. I, I had no idea until <laughs> we just yes. randomly stopped. Yes. Well, one of the things that, that um, Ingrid and I are both on the ACE National Leadership Group, and it, it is Collective Impact, and, and we, it's, it has really changed the way that I, that I look at opportunity, that I look at, at, at um, collaboration. It's been a very, very rewarding and very, very intense experience. One of the things that our kids were in our 32nd year, and in 2017, we had a wonderful videographer, Matt Perkle, with Creative Communications do a series of videos for us so that we could mark kind of what is the texture and fabric of the our kids community and what you know what you know what is our true north what sets us apart what what gives us strength what gives us resilience to do this work and um, one of the things I'd asked him was I just felt like I felt like there are millions of adult survivors out there we want to do something additional we want to do I said I want an anthem video so um, the long and short of it is he calls uh, my colleague Joe Martindale and myself and says okay I've got a concept what I can't get over for the last year and a half that I've been working with y'all is the prevalence you know that one in four girls and one in seven boys will be sexually abused by age 18 he said I just can't get over it right said, then make that the focus of this video. And I said, I want it two minutes or less because I want to have something to push out to the world. Yes. He did the most beautiful job. He, he emails us and says, I need 18 children, every shape, size, and color, and I need about 15 adults, same, just like central casting. And Jill and I were able to, we started with board staff and special friends of the agency. And the generosity of spirit that we got, we had, we had everything that we needed and more within five days. Wow. He, he, he choreographed this thing. And when you look at it, if you go to what if I told you .com and you watch this video and there's a beautiful voiceover. So we loved the, um, we love, we love the video. And then, um, the strategic pivot happened, which is an all board staff strategic, you know, it's a, it's a retreat half day. And we said, well, how are we going to brand this? And so some the marketing breakout session comes back to the big session and says, what if I told you? Because that's, a, that's the lead in many times when people are ready to share, yes. ready to, to unburden themselves, when they can't carry it by themselves anymore. The very air, Terry, in the room changed. I know, you choked me up a little bit. I mean, that's very powerful because it, it is, yes. It's like game over, this is it. So then we said, well, we, I called up Mac and I said, Mac, you're going to have to change the voiceover because we've now, you know, branded it, what if I told you? And he said, well, then I need to add children's voices. So when you watch this, it's very powerful. May it's I pretty, share that? May I like, can I put that out oh, on my yes. social media? Yes. So, so yes, yeah, so our only, so this is what's so pure about this. Our only goal is to reach as many people as possible with information and resources. So, so the next part of this was when we had this beautiful, a visual asset but we didn't have a container to really put it out there because we wanted it there to be information and resources we wanted there to be a robust container so the designathon in Nashville which is a group of, of, of creative techie people uh, they did a they did a 12-hour pop-up creative for us as a gift and they created this website and it has I need I need help I need information and I want to share the information. So when you go to what if I told you .com, you, 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 can, you, you can watch the video, the two minute video, but then you can dig into this treasure trove of yes. things. And we are linking to things like um, the suicide prevention hotline, uh, RAIN, which is Rape, Abuse, and Incest National Network, the National Child Trauma Stress Network, National Child Abuse Reporting Hotline, there are 881 child advocacy centers in the country. So there are, there's a link. If you click on that and you need to find the closest one to your community, you click on that and you put your zip code in and it shows you exactly where the closest one is. Or if you need to report um, abuse of, child abuse of any kind, you do the same thing with that link. And if you want, you know, by, it, it's by state. So it's a national resource. And we have heard from people from, you know, uh, uh, I mean, 
Boise to Baltimore, from up in Minnesota to down in Mississippi and Jacksonville and everywhere in between, they were just astounded at the amount of resources. And for the for, for adult survivors, there are um, several links to Psychology Today, to National Board of Certified Counselors, where you can click on put your zip code in, and you can find someone who specializes in working with survivors of child sexual abuse in your community. I mean, we really wanted people to, because I, as I told David Plaza with the Tennessean, our local newspaper here, I said, all of these stories, we just simply can't be putting that out there without linking people so yeah. they can connect and they can act and then they can thrive based on how they use the tools. Yes, and that's beautiful. And thank you again. Like I, I, I so get it, and I admire what you're doing with that because that's what I've tried to do. Like my sole goal with this podcast is to yes. reach as many people as possible to let others like you shine your light of hope um, as a resource for others. And then you know, then they can go to websites or they can go to coaches or they can go to you know whatever it is to to find what it is that that speaks to them and whatever it is that they need. So. Yeah, and I think that's fantastic um, that you have that that resource there. As a matter of fact, what popped in my head was I had a podcast guest on, uh, Elizabeth Sullivan, who runs Empower Survivors out of Minnesota. And so I'm going to check with her and say, hey, yeah. you, you need to check this, check out this list. And yeah. absolutely. Because she, other- she just asked me for resources. and I. And- oh, my gosh. See, I, and the thing is, we all... Of, you know, a 30-year history, now 32-year history of service in this sector, our kids sort of rebranded all of our collateral. So the ways to talk to children about child sexual abuse, keeping kids safe online, a lot of the things that we did, we rebranded for What If I Told You, and they're all on the website, which is great. But we also, under I Need Help, we also have um, a section for teenagers. There are lots of questions that teenagers have, and it is what's happening to me is that child sexual abuse? I have questions about STDs. I have questions about, and it's, so we have links to LBGTQ resources. I mean, we really, um, I'm, you know, I'm happy. And what I'm really happy about is someone like Ingrid, who is one of her superpowers is connecting people so that we get the most, you know, we get the most benefit and we help each other. You know, I'm, I'm so glad you're, you know, that you're in the position with ACES Connections. Yeah, and, and the reason why I'm in this field in the first place is because I am a adult survivor. And so that's why I wanted to make sure I keep you a spotlight on your, on your initiative because I think it's very important. And so that was what inspired me to write the blog in the first place, to get it out there because adult survivors do need resources and they are kind of forgotten about. I mean, all um, child victims of sex abuse are forgotten about, but definitely once they become adults, there's very little resources for them, a lot of, very little support. Yes, I agree. And um, again, kudos for trying to connect. And, um, you know, I, I, I've said recently um, that, as a matter of fact, I got invited to do, and I'm so excited, um, a, TEDx, <laughs> a, a, a TEDx audition for TEDx Cincinnati. So they, they had all these applicants like 150 applicants and they chose a select few and I was one of them. So I had to audition and that's what I said was, you know, we're all shining our own individual lights of hope. But as we hold hands, as we gather together, that light just continues to get brighter and brighter and brighter. And Ingrid, I think that's what you're doing is that, you know, you're kind of bringing us all together to hold one another's hands and this light is just getting just that much more powerful and beautiful. And um, so, yeah, super cool. I think that cultivating hope is the bravest thing that we can do right now. And I think it's the most essential thing we can do right now. Yes, very much so. Yeah. So any myths or facts that you would like to clarify for listeners? Yes. So, um, so I, I would say that the facts about child sexual abuse that, that, um, most of the time, uh, they're, you know, the, the child does not tell immediately because of their confusion or fear um, and, and that kind of thing. Uh, sometimes they feel guilty and, and they feel shame, which 
is is heartbreaking to me, really. Um, um, also, another fact is that um, that most of the time, I mean, like ninety five percent of the time. Um, the perpetrator is someone that's known and, and trusted and even loved by the child or the family. Um, so it's not, it's not stranger danger. Um, hmm. Let's see, what else? There, there, there might be two more. Oh, so, so one of the things that, that I always say to clinical team members is, if it's ever the minister the teacher or the coach. If the perpetrator is either uh, any of those three, when the family leaves, I want you to come into my office and say those words to me. And almost never, I mean, it is almost never, um, it, I mean, it's just, it just isn't. Now, we're conditioned because we see these really, really high profile situations like the Southern Baptist Church, the Catholic Church, or, or you know, the, the, the gymnastic situation, which was also another unbelievable um, right right deal epic um but it really the fact is just the vast majority of time that's not going on the last fact that we like to amplify is that um the uh there is almost never um genital injury um to the child because it is so different than neglect or physical abuse Child sexual abuse, the perpetrator does not want to harm the child and they don't because they don't want to lose access to the child. Um, so we have we have conducted our kids conducted an injury prevalence study that was uh, that was um, published in the end of 2016 in the Journal of Pediatric and Adolescent Gynecology. And it affirmed what had been done years before that, which is only six percent um, of the time, and I think we had a, 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 a sample size of 1,500 female patients, and only 6% of the time there was any genital injury. So, um, and so that's a really important thing to remember, but I think when, when the families bring their child here, one of the very first things they want to know is that the child's body is healthy. Right. Um, so we, we, we screen for um, STDs um, based on CDC guidelines. Um, you know, I mean, and based on, uh, you know, the, the, the nature of the sexual contact, I think that we probably um, uh, screen around half of our patients for some STD or another. So, um, so those are some of the, I think those are some of the facts that I, I think are, are really important. And it's, and it's, and it makes it, it's very complicated, you know. Um, and I'd, I would say that another fact is the vast majority of cases do not go to court. So, um, you know, uh, so in some ways that's difficult. One of the most important things, it's not um, while we, while we, uh, while it's important when, when someone is convicted and, um, and, and justice is served, I think that the most important thing for the child's um, ongoing development and healing process is is the response of the of the parent or the caregiver? Um, if if the child is believed and protected, um, the you know it is the the possibility of, of healing and resilience and thriving and flourishing um, is so much greater. Our, our message really to the child is always: this is not your fault. You've done nothing wrong. Mm -hmm. Our message to the to the caregiver is: believe and protect your child. They are resilient, and you're resilient too. So a lot of times, you know, there, we use we have a full complement of master's level social workers for good reason because we have to meet the caregiver where they are, and sometimes they're not wanting to believe that this is true. Right. And it's also heartbreaking. But you know, if someone came to your door and said, "Your father has done this to your six-year-old daughter." or your brother or the elder cousin, you wouldn't immediately, it's like, oh, I should have seen that coming. You, you know, we just don't think that those kind of things are happening. But the fact is child sexual abuse knows no boundaries. And uh, it happens in every community. And uh, so something like, what if I told you, um, being out there does a, a few things. One, it, I think it really affirms the adult survivor, 
and connects them with resources that they really do need. But the other thing that it does is really is sort of gets people at people's attention that it's real. It happens. And so here are some ways that you can do the best you can to protect the children in your life. And if God forbid something does happen to, to a child in your life, this website really helps you know how to respond and then what to do. Okay. Is that, that that's just what popped in my head was, so you, you do the aftercare of part of it. Are you doing any sort of prevention or is there, are there prevention guidelines or, you know, for what people can do to, um, I don't know, maybe notice red flags or even, yeah. Even, so, go ahead. Yeah. So all, so, so signs and symptoms are on the, what if I told you website, we also link to uh, darkness to light. And I think we really do. We really endorse, uh, adults um, taking responsibility, finding a training, you know, going to see the, the screening of resilience, finding a darkness to light training, um, and really taking responsibility and educating themselves. So that, because what this does is, okay, now that the blinders are off and I realize it really does happen, it really could happen to my child, then now I am equipped so when my child goes to someone's home for a sleepover, I can ask the questions like, what kind of supervision is in place? Are there older children there? Are they being um, supervised? It's just like if you would say, you know, do you allow your, what kind of supervision on the screen? You know, the internet. I mean, all of those things, you know, all those things are crucial right now. The, the, the gravity, and, the, and I hate to sound like this, but the dangers are just more vast and more varied. Right. Right. It's just yeah. true. And I know we, um, my daughter goes to parochial school and I know that, and I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, but we have to do a Virtus, V-I-R-T-U-S. And so they, they send us like monthly newsletters that we have to read and it's filled with information about those exact sort of things and those kinds of questions to ask, which I think is amazing. But I know it like uh, at her school, um, you know, they've put so much stuff in, in, place about no child is to be alone with an adult that are always has to be to adult. I mean, there's just so many things and I think so many other schools and, you know, volunteer organizations are doing those sorts of things, which is needed. Yes. Policies, policies really do protect. Yeah. But they only protect if they're consistent and they're followed and they're, you know, they're here to. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and then any myths, did you, did, did you have any myths that you, wanted to address so uh, so this is this is an interesting thing I think language is really powerful um, and what I have learned so what's really exciting is uh, Ingrid probably knows more about this than I do but the state of Tennessee is I think the first state in the country that has com is completely has has um, uh, adverse childhood experience um, initiatives all the way across the state and we have state funding that is protected um, from political will so that there will be money set aside for collective impact um, uh, initiatives and projects and also the building strong brains and who, who is the um, there is a frameworks frameworks is the um, this um, the, yes Tell them about Building Strong Brains. Oh, well, Building Strong Brains is the curriculum that we have here for the state for all of our ACES trainers. And so we collaborated with Frameworks Institute to frame it in a way that allows the um, message to turn into action. So a lot of times we have a lot of scary statistics that we give people, and that doesn't mean that once they have the information that that is going to lead to behavior change. And so we did the work with frameworks to try to make sure that as you get the message that it leads to behavior change and what are the what's the call to action after that. And so that has been very beneficial to us to get a lot of our um, you know state officials on board so that we have very it's very easy for us to get things done statewide because we set up a framework in our in our state that allows for that to happen through our state agencies. And, and the reason why I brought this up, which I think this is really important, is um, when you asked about are there any myths. So what Frameworks has taught us is that uh, that adults, when they hear myths next to facts, that they that they many times retain or remember 
the myth instead of the fact. And uh -huh. so, so last summer, um, Jill Martindale and I did a presentation to uh, uh, Ace Nashville Quarterly uh, Learning Collaborative. Uh, and so, and we were, uh, Jill, we, we showed the two minute video and then Jill was, was navigating through the What If I Told You website and it came to this area and it was, <laughs> it came to this thing underneath I want information and I did have some stuff around myths and so there were two people from the state that came running over to me during the break and they said, you have to, you really need to take the myth stuff out. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I forgot that, you know. So it was great to get that collegial, uh, honest feedback in the moment. <laughs> and I think that the website's better for it, but I had forgotten that. So it's about adult learning. Right. Push behind that, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's fascinating. It's good for me to know to just yeah. Yeah, to, so yeah. just turn it around and make it a fact. Uh, yes, exactly. Okay, I got gotcha. you. Exactly. All right. Well, good to know. Thanks. Yeah. Um, yeah. How about um, so resources that um, you you know you talked about the resources that you um, have used. Is there any in particular that really stand out that you you want to share with listeners? So I, the two, the two that I think um, that I think are really outstanding that we've used for quite some time, and you know, need is the mother of invention. You see, I, it, it always. So we were doing a, a new board training. This was probably six years ago, and most of our these new board members had little kids, like you know, under the age of three. So they, we start the clinical team members were talking to them about how to talk to their children, you know, and how all that stuff. And so, but it was. And so one of them said, well, I would just say, don't let anybody touch your private parts. And so the clinical team was like, well, the problem with that is that they're not big enough to stop somebody. Right. And also there, there are times when they may need help with toileting, toiletry, you know, going to the bathroom. And so we dug into it a little bit more. And like the thing, a lot of times the things that people sort of say, you know, or if anybody ever, ever touches you, you know, I'll, kill them or you know um, yes <laughs> you know there are just all these things that, that people um say because they're trying to protect their child but they're really setting their child up for like a double bind like you know like this isn't really helpful and a lot of times and and i, I think i probably said the same thing as a young mother but but certainly teaching children the real names of their body parts is really important. Um, and, and, and really, the most important thing is cultivating an environment in your home where, you know, where your energy is that you can come to me and tell me anything. If something confuses you or scares you or makes you feel icky, you can come and tell me, and it's okay. I think that we forget that children are very afraid of adults really large responses yes big anger and the big you know um even if the adult is wanting to be the advocate and the champion sometimes children are really overwhelmed by our very large responses and so staying calm but really i think creating that environment in the home where you can talk to me about anything yes that's the most important thing for sure Right. I, my poor kids, I think I drove them crazy because I would, I would talk about almost everything, you know, and, and, and would encourage them to do so. And they were like, we got it, mom. <laughs> like, <I'm their> <laughs> the the yeah. other thing that, that it, under the, under the, um, I want information part of what if I told you dot com there, we, we did several years ago, we, um, we identified a very strange pattern in our medical practice, which was pre-adolescents and very young adolescents being lured into very dangerous and terrible uh, situations through apps on their phones. Yeah. And they thought that they were connecting with a 14-year-old boy, and it ended up being a 29-year-old man. Right. Or, or older, whatever. And in that situation, a lot of times, the, the, you know, the child is like a deer in the headlights. And so, you know, because we are really one of the largest clinics of our kind in the country, we felt the obligation to, uh, you know, to, to look into this and, and develop something that we could share with the community and, you know, sort of like alert community 
people and parents and grandparents. So um, <clears throat> one of the one of our favorite detectives with Metro uh, Police, Rob Kerrigan, who um, is an expert in cyber crimes against children, came to to educate the staff, and we were like about these apps and of course the apps are changing every moment so it's not like you can memorize the apps and you're, they're always ahead of us but really understanding the need for guidelines and supervision um, so so I said well this is value added would you come back and 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 train the board members and so he said of course I will and then the board members just went crazy and they said we have got to create a really nice cogent piece of collateral material about you know, really alerting uh, people with children in their lives about how do you keep kids safe online? Right. And so that's one of the that's one of our pieces under um, I want information. Oh. Under you know, I, what pops into my head is you know, and I sit here and I talk, and I just have to say this out loud because it's it's in my head is, you know, I think about these numbers like on your site it says you know one in seven. What is it? One in seven boys. One, one, in, one in four boys. girls. One in seven boys. Okay. Yeah. And I think, who are these predators? Why are there so many? Like, what is happening? I don't understand. Um, yeah, and it just infuriates me and angry angers me. Like, what what is happening that's creating this? Um, yeah, I don't know. And it's heartbreaking. I don't know if there's studies being done or or what. What is being done to try to address, you know, not just protecting our children, but the prevention end of it, like right. from the predators? Um, yeah, unfortunately, and there's a lot of research, research to support this, is that a lot of predators have been abused themselves as children. And so I want to make sure that I'm clear that not, you know, all people who are abused become predators. Right. But most predators have been abused. And so it's very important to know that it is cyclical. That. Yeah, so breaking that cycle, right, okay. Well, the other thing that I think is really interesting is that um, it's really disturbing how often here at our kids, you know, if you sit and you dwell with someone who's in crisis and you really do, you are really with them and time goes by, they have a chance to calm down. And I think that what happens is that the person really begins to believe that the social worker in Arkansas really does care about them. They're not judging them. They are respecting them. And they really do, they really are interested in, in the story, in your story, you know, in the caregivers. What else is going on in the home? How are you doing? Yeah. What else is going on with you? And, 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 and giving plenty, I mean, trauma-informed means that we, we don't rush people. We have to give people enough time and space and a place to really unpack, you know, part of their story. And it is it is jarring to me how often caregivers will say, "I've never ever told anybody this." Oh. It happens. It happened to me when I was seven, and it was my grandfather. It happened to me when I was four, when I was eleven, um, and and. Um, Many times, I mean, many times, they they are saying, I, "This is the first time I've ever said it out loud." Right. So the fact that you know, the fact that I mean, the benefits of being trauma informed and the benefits of having a not just excellent nurse practitioners, but a full complement of really, really gifted social workers to um, spend the time. Um, I, I think that when we are aware, when we can be more aware of our own internal states um, and what we need and we can start taking care of ourselves, we are far more able to be helpful and loving and emotionally available to the children in our lives. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Well, and that just makes me think of, you know, ACEs and Ingrid and, and the, commu the community, you know, you're a very big part of is... Um, you know, a lot of the conversation revolves around helping the adults heal. And as you help the adults heal, then you can stop that cycle. And, you know, the cycle of violence, the cycle of what, whatever it is, the cycle yeah. of poverty, the cycle is you help them heal. Um, so, yeah, that's, I'm sure, a big part of the answer. And that also makes sure that we don't re-traumatize people when they start to interface with different agencies. So as our staffs, 
within these agencies, nonprofit agencies, are, are becoming trauma informed, then they also do not re traumatize individuals coming for help. Yes. Right. Absolutely. And it's, it's fascinating to me. The whole trauma informed thing is fascinating because I worked in a mental health agency uh, with children and, you know, the, even talk about when this first started to come onto the scene of, um, you know, how the waiting room is set up, um, you know, with people not having their backs to one another. And uh, it was, it was just very fascinating. And, you know, the artwork, I mean, the lighting is there's so much stuff that's involved now you know, and helping to realize, you know, um, you know, from the people that they talk to, if you send a male in versus a female, you know, for, for someone who's maybe possibly been through a rape. I mean, it's just, it, it, again, very intriguing, uh, fascinating how it's all starting to come together into this beautiful trauma-informed, hopefully, world. Yes. Yeah, yeah very much so. Um, okay, any... Um, Oh, I have to ask you both my favorite question, only because it's my favorite in all the world, and yeah, <laughs> I, I love the answer, so, and you can, you can both answer, or just one of you, however you want to do it, so if you could meet anyone in the world, dead or alive, to help you with your mission, who would it be? I'll let you go first, <laughs> 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 Well, you know, I, um... I'm a big fan of the Obamas, and uh, I'm reading Becoming right now, Michelle Obama's uh, book, and uh, I love her voice. She's a beautiful writer, and um, I don't know. It might be her. Um, uh, I also think of uh, maybe uh, St. Augustine would also be another, another, uh, you know, another, another person that... Uh, you know, we, I think would have great wisdom about all manner of things, because really, for me, this is a, this is a, this is a spiritual. This is a, for me, it is not. This is not just a job. It's not even just a profession. It is. Um, it's really the way. And I'm very thankful. I feel like I'm one of the most fortunate people in the world to have found um, purpose and meaning that that actually um, really allows me to integrate every part of who I am in service to others because really um, serving is really um, uh, what I want to do. Yeah, I call it soul work. Like this is my soul work, you know? Yes, girl. I, yes, girl. Yeah. I got a sign on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've actually met Michelle Obama. Oh my God. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> Uh, I think my person would be Zora Neale Hurston. She's an author, um, but I really like her spirit. I think she's very resilient. She's passed away now, but she um, she was an author during the Harlem Renaissance, and she got a lot of flack for being optimistic. Uh, she's a black woman, and she's you know obviously dealing with racism and sexism of the time, but she was still very uh, optimistic and happy. And people were like, "Well, there's all this you know bad things going on in the world. You're too happy to be a writer at this time." And, and her, one of her things was she really didn't have time to deal with, with racism, is that she was too busy sharpening her oyster knife. And so I thought that was, I think she's my inspiration. That's fantastic. And I just have to say, my nickname is Glitter Shitter. And so, <laughs> Glitter what? Glitter Shitter. So people, like, like people call me Glitter Shitter. And it is because I'm so happy all the time. And they're like, oh my gosh, you're always so happy and joyous. And, you know, and I'm like, and so the, the, I kind of got the name the Glitter Shitter. And, but yeah, because I, I choose to focus on the positivity. So I love that answer. That's fantastic. I mean, you know, I think that the three of us have a, the bias of optimism. You know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we really need that. I mean, we really do need that. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, anything else that you would like to address with uh, listeners that we haven't touched on yet? Uh, I would just say go to whatifitoldyou.com. Watch this two minute video. It's truthful, it's beautiful, and it's also hopeful. And then you know, uh, navigate through the website. It is a treasure trove. It really is. That's what, that's what I would leave with. And also you are just delightful. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. I would add to go to acesconnection.com. Yes, they have yes. so many resources and a lot of different blogs and a lot of perspectives on, um, 
the whole ACEs, you know, being ACE informed and trauma informed journey and healing community. So I think they're an excellent resource as well. So yes. check us out. Yes, amen and hallelujah to that. I, I, I have, I tell everybody I know to go to ACES Connection, um, and I'll send them to our kids as well. But ACES Connection, because you know, I'm a member and a contributing member. Um, you know, I love it that it's got, you know, anything from blogs to videos to research to, um, you know, survivors to, I mean, it, it's from professionals to, to those who have lived through it. And, you know, then those of us who are doing both. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Well, Thank it's you for having uh, us. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Yes. It's been a joy having you both on. I, I thank you again for the amazing work that both of you are doing. Um, thank you so much um, for shining your light of hope and um, yeah. It's it's been a joy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, everybody. Thank you for joining us on the Healing Place podcast. And until next time, remember to be gentle with yourselves. Thanks. Bye bye. <laughs>